right, Jake. Hey, congratulations on After America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so, uh, so first of all, tell us, um, how does it feel that it, this film is being showcased at Slamdance this year? Oh, it's wonderful. It's great to be, it's kind of an honor to be in Slamdance. It feels very fitting, the kind of independent spirit of the festival and the taking artistic risks and trying to kind of find new and different ways of making films in America uh, is very in line with, I think, what I've done for a long time, but also very much with this film, with After America as well. So it's really exciting and kind of special to be part of the Rabble Rouser crew this year. That is terrific to hear. And yet you're obviously your documentary is, is uh, very different from other ones out there. So mm -hmm. tell us what sparked you to make this documentary After America. Sure. So After America, it's interesting because it's kind of something, I don't know if I would necessarily call it a traditional documentary. Um, I've been referring to more as a fictional film because the stories we see aren't true, but they're based or built from true life. So I was kind of um, spending some time working in Los Angeles, kind of in the belly of the beast, in the heart of everything, and seeing how we were making films still. And it reminded me, a I was sort of shocked, I have to admit, because the technology and this sort of fabled democratization of making films, it's so cheap, it's so readily available, we can do it in so many different ways, but we often choose not to. And we're still making films like it's the 1930s. Uh, and some of it, you know, the technology back then didn't really allow for us to really build kind of human connections when we were doing it. It was usually like, we have to have all these lights and hit your mark and do this and make this and then move on. And now there's so many different ways to make films in different ways that we can get to kind of the truths that are surrounding us and the things we see in our everyday life and try to get through that kind of um, those narratives and those ideas that films have taught us the way life should be and the way we should kind of act. And we kind of just fall into that pattern, like learned behavior. And so I was interested in kind of throwing the rule book out the door and just kind of leaping into the unknown and saying, well, what's a different way for making films? What's a way that kind of doesn't allow us to stay on those filmmaking crutches and those storytelling uh, things we rely on, the things we fall back on? And so with this film, I was really sort of inspired by a lot of kind of countercultural and avant-garde theater practices and sort of experimental psychology from the 1960s too. So I was seeing a lot of kind of this, I, this thing that had been happening then, which now looking back is crazy because it was also a time of great sort of um, societal shifts and kind of unrest and things changing in the country that now, you know, a couple of years into making and finishing the film seems like there's a big parallel to the 1960s and now. Um, and so I was really interested in saying like, well, what these things seem to do was about what is bubbling under the surface? What are we feeling and we not talking about? What is sort of being repressed? And what is this kind of dissonance, this disconnect between these ideas of the way we're supposed to be living our lives? Whether it was sort of 1950s, you know, American dream Americana or today's sort of Instagram and Kardashian ultra wealth ideals that are not re doable really. And how does that leave people and how are we struggling against those? And so armed with barely an idea, I just went to the Twin Cities, uh, my hometown, Minneapolis, and I just did an open call. And I, my version of auditions was like kind of getting coffee, like having a 15, 20 minute chat. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for about four or 500 people from all over, just whoever. You have acting experience, you don't, you're interested, you stumbled across this, Across the street, come on in, it's fine. And from that, I whittled down seven main uh, kind of collaborators who ended up starring in the film that come from very different backgrounds, but all based in the Twin Cities. So um, uh, there's Ahmed, who is uh, immigrated 30 years ago now, uh, but immigrated from Somalia because the Twin Cities has a very large Somalian population. He's a poet and playwright and educator. There's Robert Dante, who's a three-time world champion bullwhip expert who tours the country doing rodeos and s &M conventions. Uh, there's um, Dan, who's a uh, young uh, model and actor who's a deaf queer man. Um, and then kind of all kinds of different folks all on. So kind of getting a snapshot of the Twin Cities. And we did a workshop process together that lasted about six weeks where I got together one-on-one -on -one and we just sort of explored our lives, what we were struggling with, what we were dealing with, what was kind of bubbling under the surface that we never felt like there was a place to let it out. 
And then that workshopping led into the filming. And so the filming became somewhere between the, the emotional reality mm -hmm. and the emotions of documents are true. But then the stories would sort of like kiss the reality of what was going on, but then also maybe kind of go down paths of their own sort of dreams and things they wish they could do. And so it was somewhere between reality and kind of um, exploring what you maybe always wanted to do, but never had the guts to do. Um, and the result, I mean, honestly, I had no idea what I was doing and that was kind of lovely. It was everything I was taught not to do in filmmaking. So I just trusted the people I was with. I trusted our instincts and we just sort of dove forward. Tell, tell me about the uh, process of recreation because of obviously um, they, some of the scenes has to, has to be recreated, right? Because it, it's not like you were there for, for some of the incidences. Hello? Jake, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. I think I missed part of your question. I, I was saying, um, tell me about the process of the recreation of some of the scenes, because uh, because obviously you can't you can't be there for you know for all the incidences, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of it was almost in a way like. Um, situational improv at times, I would say. When I was meeting with the participants who ended up being in the film and starring in the film, what I kind of ended up saying to them from the get-go was like, this is gonna look a lot of different ways. I don't know what it's gonna totally look like when we start filming. Some days it might feel like we're just like kids with a camera. Some days it'll feel like we're doing like improv, situational improv or kind of reality TV, which often is sort of the same thing. Um, and then some days it'll feel like a real movie. You know, there'll be lights and we'll hit marks and all this. And we'll kind of decide and figure out together what that means. I would say probably most of it ended up being somewhere between kind of kids with a camera just documenting what's happening and situ situational improv. So a lot of the time we would go to a place that maybe had some meaning or experience or even a thing they just had to do today. Um, like Eli, who plays Wayne, um, Brooke, who plays Margaret, his mother in the film, they're also you know, mother and child. And so he is a contractor and he needs to do repairs on her house. And we just went over there and we followed that relationship around. And her concerns about wanting to taser cats in her backyard, that's something she was talking about. And that was things that were going on. And so we just kind of like found, I think for me, it was less about trying to have these big sort of societal questions that we sort of tackle a lot of the time in film these days. And especially in whether it's fiction or nonfiction, storytelling. It feels like we're trying to get at this. And I was more interested, well, what's the actual boots on the ground, emotional minutia connections that links us all together? Because I think there's more truth in there and more honesty and more reality of what's going on rather than these sort of like big narratives that um, we, I think, often look to film to kind of express or to tell. Um, I think sometimes the reality of what's going on on the ground level can get lost in these larger stories that we try to tell often with film, at least in America. So th through, through your process, what have you discovered about, you know, about America or our anxieties to, to achieve um, success in America? Oh, we're all super anxious. <laughs> I think that's the biggest thing. It takes on different forms, but it's all there. I think I think the biggest thing is that it's very, I, when I was working with people, I used to kind of say this is a joke and it's kind of glib, but I think it's true is that most of our behavior towards each other is us masking what we really feel. Like actually being honest with one another is mostly happens in moments of crisis. It's like when all else fails, when your significant other, you know, the person you're in love with is walking out the door on someone's deathbed, when someone gets, when something terrible happens when you have like when the pandemic hit and we were really worried about one another suddenly we'd be able to at that moment of crisis that moment when it feels like all is lost we can finally because we have another option we can finally begin to say what we really feel and be truthful and because we're never really being honest with one another we're not and often not even honest with ourselves there's this anxiety and there's this struggle always bubbling along and I think America has had a very, I mean, at least in my lifetime, but it seems like it goes back at least a few more decades than that, has a hard time being honest with itself. We are sort of the greatest civilization of myth-making. 
and film and the fact that, you know, we created Hollywood as a country and as a people is really no surprise to me that our sort of way of advertising, our sort of way of storytelling, our way of myth making, it's something we're really great at, but we sort of end up drinking that Kool-Aid ourselves too. And so we begin to blur, I think we've blurred for a long time, the sort of narrative myths that surround us. We're kind of surrounded by the sea of competing narratives. And we struggle with these myths because they're ideals, they're not real. They're not necessarily achievable, but we're, we're so we, we don't always realize that. So I think in different ways we're always struggling, whether that means I wanna have the American dream or I wanna have the sort of like wealthy American dream or I wanna be the successful artist, whatever that might mean. Like we have these kind of concepts, these loose ideas of what things are supposed to be or the country's supposed to be this way or everyone should be this way or I should be this way. And so we're always sort of judging ourselves and our lives and our communities to these myths. And you can never achieve that. So we live in this constant struggle and I think this constant feeling of failure and that we're not adding it up and that be creates a real kind of dangerous, I think, subterranean kind of underbelly of anxiety and resentment. Um, and when that bubbles up, which I feel like in the last six months in America, we've seen it bubble up in many different ways, all of which are kind of, can be very striking and scary and dangerous. And I think they, when we repress it all down, we don't deal with it, then it's gonna eventually come back up and it comes back up, it will burst up instead of us a lot, finding ways of letting it come up in a way that's maybe more healthy. Obviously, you ended your documentary on a happy note, but a lot of things have happened since then, since you completed your documentary, not to mention the city of uh, Minneapolis. Have you tried to follow up on um, some of your subjects? Yeah, I've been in touch with um, most of them throughout it. I mean, I think uh, not all of us are, you know, from or at least born and raised in Minneapolis like I was, but a few of us were. And I think the the murder of George Floyd and the unrest that followed is a part of the history of our town and our community. And there's no, I mean, it's a, it's a huge turning point. Um, but I think for a lot of us, it's not that surprising. It's just surprising that it happened now and in this way. Um, kind of what was been bubbling underneath some of the um, uh, sort of economic disparity based on race, the way the city's kind of carved out in this way, it's not really new, but also the city's like, um, in the community's long history of protest and activism is also not new, but I just think for folks that are not from around here, you might not know that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it was sort of shocking to see these places, these neighborhoods that I lived in um, for years and that you know many of my friends and some of even the people in the film live in burning. You know, I think that's always kind of shocking, especially at a time when there was so much tension because of the pandemic and everything else. And I think for me, this film ends up being sort of a time capsule leading up to that bursting. Um, it's looking at sort of what was bubbling under the surface before things broke out in a way we didn't expect. Um, and so what I kind of noticed was once the murder happened and the unrest happened, suddenly we had this wave of interest. Hmm. And folks, local people came in, but then national, international, like suddenly all these people flocked. And you kind of saw that sort of um, the sensational media, everyone comes in to get the story. Everyone's talking about what's happening, what's gonna happen, what's this, but no one really gives a lot of attention. Maybe there's a few articles here and there of like, how did we get here? What was the history that led us here? What brought us to this moment? And what are the nuances in that? Um, and I think for me that like our film kind of captures some of that essence um, but I think we're all, I think, you know, it's a sort of as a country and as each individuals and as a community, we're all kind of having to find a kind of, to some extent, um, face and hopefully begin to reconcile with our past as well as our present as we kind of move forward. And I think the Twin Cities are kind of having to do that in ways that it was never really forced to do on this scale before. So I think the ripple effect of everyone sort of reflecting um, on things is kind of probably will be the biggest impact. And I think everyone involved with the film kind of has some of that too, because, you know, every, there, every single individual's experience in this and their history with the city is so different that all of our response to what happened is also very different. That's true. Well, 
as I'm starting to wrap things up uh, with you, when audiences do check out After America, what is the one most important take that you hope they would walk away with? I think just let it go. <laughs> like, you know, the there's um, there's all there's a um, there's this idea sometime uh, that I like to think about that is when you're faced with two poles, when you feel like you only have two options, whether it's two parties, whether it's two choices, whether it's good and bad, whether it's black and white, there's always a third. There's always other options. There's always an alternative. And if things, even if you're in that kind of like comfortable misery, there's always another option. There's always a way to let it go, to enjoy yourself, uh, and to find something else and find what comes after the state that you are currently existing in. So I hope that the experience of watching the film kind of sheds light on these people and this community of Twin Cities, and, but hopefully has people sort of reflect on the state of this country they live in, the mm -hmm. state of the communities they live in, and more importantly, the state of their own being and whether you can free yourself from the anxieties and the things that kind of hold you back. Not necessarily to achieve something, but just living a sort of content and happy life. Excellent. Well, what, one, one last thing, mm -hmm. just, just with you here, because obviously we would have loved to be at Slam Dance, you know, watching your film, and I would have loved to speak to you in person. But I would like to know is, how are you staying sane and creative during times like this? Well, I'm about three weeks into a new feature production. <laughs> so I don't know if sane is a good thing I'm saying. Um, but I'm keeping real busy. Um, so that's kind of like, I feel very blessed in the fact of doing that. And my particular, the way I kind of started working um, for making films that led into After America is kind of from the ground up saying, you know, like, how can we make films differently? Not only like, what are we doing in front of the camera, but what, more importantly, what are we doing behind the camera? So working with a small team, rethinking how we're doing things to make sure it's safe, kind of having all of that, you know, all the PPE, all the testing, all the stuff for COVID, it's actually very easy for us to adapt into that because every time I start a project with my collaborators, I'm like, how do we want to do this? Let's not take anything for granted. Um, and also I'm perfectly happy to sort of be, I don't know, maybe it's growing up in a frozen tundra, but being stuck inside for like months at a time, just like researching and working on stuff kind of was raised that way. So it's been easier for me, <laughs> I think, than some folks to just like chill out, read some stuff, work on some stuff. And then now that we're kind of in the midst of filming, um, I've been very fortunate to kind of have these opportunities, even at a time when things seem so crazy. And I think for myself too, even at times when it seems like, well, what do we do? Should we be making work at a, when things are so serious? I think of the folks like even like the Italian neorealists or other artists or writers who really inspired me. And a lot of them come out, they've been, they made that work that was so inspiring to me at these moments of incredible societal unrest. Mm. These big, you know, revolutions, turning points, you know, giant famines and wars and depressions and other epidemics. And I think there's something uh, for all of us that have that drive to need to express something and be creative and make art or films or anything in that kind of cultural realm. Um, I think for me, it's important to just keep making because it's going to kind of be infused to the spirit of the time that you're making it in. Uh, and since many, so many people are on unemployment, I'm like, hey, it's great. It's like you're on the dole. Just make some stuff. Make some stuff that you don't have to worry about because, you know, you might not get this chance again. Terrific. That is a terrific answer. Hey, Jake, once again, congratulations for Slam Dance and After America. We really appreciate you uh, speaking to us about this film. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Hey, thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.